bienvenue. Welcome to the Alliance Française. I am the executive director, uh, Sarah Diligenti, for those of you who don't know me, and quite a lot of you don't know me here today. Uh, merci, uh, Madame l'attachée culturelle of the Embassy of France, to be here today as well, Julie, chère Julie. And I am actually very honored and, well, and uh, happy to be able to welcome back within the uh, Alliance Française somebody who was here before my time. Uh, it was uh, Pascal Soha, who was academic director at the Alliance Française here in DC uh, until 2005, at which time I took over. But then Pascal moved to uh, higher up in the Alliance Française at the Lake Delegation. General and then uh, now works, if I remember well, at the World Bank. It's still in education, maybe? No, no not anymore. Well, and, and well, but well. yeah, but we, we we love having him back today at the Alliance Française of Washington DC. Uh, without further ado, I will leave uh, Gregory, who is the executive director of IQA, which I would pronounce ICWA, but apparently it's IQA. Uh, he will introduce uh, the speaker today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Sarah. Thank you very much to the Alliance Française uh, for having us here in this beautiful setting uh, in, on this rather chilly day today, I have to say. Um, and also thanks very much to the uh, French Embassy's cultural attaché, Julie Lassaus, uh, as Sarah said, and to all of you for coming here today. Uh, I'd also like to thank our, our trustee, uh, Pascal Sora, uh, for organizing uh, this event here. Uh, before I introduce uh, our speaker, I would like to say uh, a few words about the Institute of Current World Affairs, uh, which is almost uh, a century old, and whose genesis is actually tied uh, in, in some way to Paris. That's where President Woodrow Wilson took our founder, Charles Crane, for the Versailles, Ver the Versailles Treaty uh, ending the uh, First World War. Crane was a philanthropist and a diplomat uh, who was a friend and close advisor of President Wilson's. And at the treaty convention, Wilson appointed Crane to head a commission that would travel across the Middle East and talk to the newly liberated people of the very recently former Ottoman Empire about how they wanted to determine their own futures and also pre preaching Wilsonian self-determination. Crane spent two years traveling the region, talking to many people, and compiling a long report. But as fate had it, the report landed on Wilson's desk the day before he suffered a debilitating stroke, effectively ending his presidency. By then, the European powers were already busy dividing the Ottoman Empire by secret negotiation and treaty. And Crane realized that as a newly emerged global power, the United States was operating at a disadvantage because the old great powers had colonies and colonial administrators traveling back to the center with deep on the ground knowledge from various parts of the world. The United States didn't. So Crane founded the Institute with the idea of sending outstanding young professionals to gain deep knowledge abroad by uh, embarking on fellowships that were open-ended at first. Our fellowships now are two years, uh, and the, f the first fellowships lasted as much as six or seven years. Uh, among the first fellows, John Hazard spent six years in the Soviet Union at the height of the Great Terror. He returned to help found Columbia University's Russian Institute, now the Harriman Institute, and become one of the preeminent Western scholars of Soviet law. Doak Barnett went on his fellowship to China in the 1940s and came back to head China studies at Johns Hopkins Sice and write many books. But he was best known for persuading Presidents Johnson and Nixon to restore relations with China before that country's opening in 1972. More recent fellows include Andrew Tabler, who is in the audience here, uh, who just stepped down as Syria director on the National Security Council. Uh, and Congresswoman Pramila Jayapal, who was a leader of the progressive wing of House Democrats. Now, Karina Pizer has returned from a very stellar fellowship in France, where she examined identity politics and Islam at a time that deep knowledge of foreign affairs is needed as much as ever in this country in the face of a US retreat from global affairs. We were very much reminded of that yesterday during President Emmanuel Macron's, or the day before, uh, 
pesky meeting with President Trump in London uh, at the NATO summit. And who can forget Macron's bone-crushing handshake with Donald Trump uh, about two years ago. Of course, Macron is uh, in some ways now becoming the face of Europe at a time that the European project is facing major challenges. But France is also dealing with some of the same political and social convulsions as the rest of the world. And in some ways, the issues are more complicated. And I'm not talking about just the strikes that are taking place today. The Yellow Vest movement is leaderless and uncontrollable as a largely spontaneous phenomenon. The motives and issues aren't black and white. And Karina has looked into this and other issues on her fellowship, which she began by looking at the implementation of laïcité, the state policy of secularism, and Muslims in public high schools. She broadened her research into examining the place of Islam in society at large and fundamental questions about how the French define Frenchness, not only in terms of identity, but legally about what society tolerates, including the wearing of the veil. But I will let Karina explain that for herself. I'll just finish by saying that she now writes for the Financial Times, The Atlantic, and many other publications, and is increasingly appearing on television. Following her talk, uh, she will take questions for 10 minutes uh, before joining our panel discussion. And finally, I just ask that you please silence your cell phones. Thank you very much. Karina. <laughs> Hello. Thank you all for joining me. It's nice to see uh, such a full room. Um, thank you to Greg for that introduction. Um, so as Greg said, the main focus of my research over two years were debates around French national identity, this kind of ongoing soul searching over what it means to be French. Uh, and I thought that it would be useful to begin with an anecdote um, to kind of offer a case of how these debates play out in, in real time in French society. Uh, a little over a year ago, there was a young woman, the president of the French National Student Union, the UNEF, who went on national television to discuss a reform package. There had been, the education ministry had announced a series of reforms to the higher education system. It was a major news story. Um, they were changing the way that undergraduate students select what field they want to study. Um, so this young woman goes on television to discuss the union's opposition to these reforms. In the hours and days that followed her interview, the nation broke out into controversies over what she had to say. Curiously, given that this was a highly relevant news story, none of the controversies were actually related to the education reforms. Um, they were all about this young woman, Mariam Pouchetou. And the reason is because she wore a hijab. And in France, which defends a vision of secularism or laïcité that is different than the understanding of secularism in the United States, the wearing of the headscarf often sparks controversy. Um, so this chance TV appearance gave everyone in the public sphere a chance to weigh in, from public intellectuals to the highest members of government. Um, for example, the essayist Celine Pina tweeted to her nearly 20,000 Twitter followers that Pushtu exemplified the Muslim Brotherhood's infiltration of student unions and said that the hijab is not a marker of Islam, but of Islamism and communal withdrawal. Um, among the government officials who weighed in was Macron's gender secre Secretary for Gender Equality, Marlene Schiappa, who called Pushtu's hijab proof of religion's grip and a form of promotion of political Islam. And perhaps the highest level government official to weigh in was at the time the interior minister, Gerard Colomb, who in a much watched nightly uh, talk show compared Mariam Pouchetou to the quote, youth that are attracted to the Islamic State and said that her presence in the UNEF showed the need to foster a quote, moderate Islam to oppose this radical Islam. And the moderator kind of pressed him on this point. Would any form of head covering be acceptable? He asked the interior minister. And finally, Gerard Colomb said that some sort of veil might be OK, just not the full veil, which he left undefined, that Pouchetou wears. 
And then he went on, and I think that this quote is quite exemplary of, of the climate and the tensions within the understanding of French national identity and of French secularism. He said, my mother, when she went to church, would wear a sort of veil, and perhaps yours did the same. And that was a sign, a religious sign, but not a voluntary marker of identity to show that you are different from French society. So as I mentioned earlier, Pushtu's case is kind of just one in a much longer, now decades long, ongoing national reckoning over what it means to be French and how Islam factors into this definition of national identity. These controversies really started picking up in the 1980s, but the concept of French secularism has nothing to do with contemporary debates over identity or Islam, even though that's the context in which it's often invoked. Um, Laïcité is rooted in the French Revolution, in the rejection of the Catholic Church, which was a pro-monarchy, anti-revolutionary force, and ultimately debates over how to keep religion in the private sphere, keep religion separate from politics, led to the 1905 law, which is the French law of laïcité. Um, and the law in itself, which I think I was surprised to learn when I started my fellowship, is at its core, a law that's designed to promote religious tolerance. It's based on three fundamental principles. Freedom of conscience, the separation of political institutions from religious institutions, and the equal footing before the law of different religions and beliefs. And I think that for, the most, for most of the 20th century, that was how the law was implemented and the way that that was how the law was discussed in public life. But in the 1980s, France underwent demographic changes. Um, there had been a significant wave of immigration from former colonies in Africa and North Africa following decolonization, so in the 1960s. Um, and by the 1980s, those immigrants had had children who were born and raised French. And many of them also happened to be Muslim. Um, and so this kind of opened this questioning over whether or not those two identities could coexist in, in French society. Um, and the headscarf kind of became the emblem of, of these debates. So the first controversy was in 1989, um, and it took place in schools over girls wearing a headscarf. It's called the first Affaire du Foulard. I'm sure many of you have heard of it, and it took place in a suburb outside of Paris when two sisters refused to remove their hijab at their middle school. The media descended on the incident, and there were debates around it for a decade and a half that kind of were left unresolved until 2004, when a law was passed that banned all forms of religious, ostensible religious signs from public schools. Um, and this law is seen as a major turning point in the way that laïcité is defined. Um, up until then, it had only uh, this requirement of neutrality, this requirement that public officials not wear any religious signs was limited to school teachers or to government officials. This was the first time that it applied to students. Um, and for a lot of French Muslims, this law kind of marked a moment where laïcité became all about Islam as opposed to about religion in general. Um, so many of you might be thinking that I just said that this law applies to all religious symbols. Um, so why am I talking about it in the case of Islam? And that's true. The law, as I said, refers to all ostensible religious signs. It specifically mentions the kippah, a large cross, and the headscarf, kind of referencing the three major religions in France. Um, but when I arrived and was doing my research, everyone kept referring to it as the headscarf law. And a lot of people referred to it as an Islamophobic law. So I kind of wanted to understand what the people who made the law had in mind when they crafted it. So I, a month after starting my fellowship, contacted a man by the name of Jean-Pierre Aubin, who was a high-ranking education official at the time that the law was passed and was central to the creation of the 2004 law. And I asked him how to explain either to Muslim, young Muslim girls who don't like the law, who think that it is, was designed to target them, or just kind of to society or to a lot of Americans who have heard about this law as the headscarf law, how to explain that that's not the case or whether or not that is the case. Um, and he said that that would be complicated uh, because, and this is a quote, the truth is the contrary. The law was made in response to a religion that manifested itself in an ostentatious way, the Muslim religion, which has a strong proselytizing dimension. So 
this law doesn't apply to Marianne Pouchetou, the student union president, because it only applies to lower education and she was a college student. But the reason that they're connected is because from what I observed and from the interviews I did, this law, which was passed now 15 years ago, left a fundamental trace on French society and on, the, on attitudes toward religion and its place in the public sphere. Um, so even if it doesn't apply to a college student, it's theoretical underpinnings and kind of this assumption that a display of religion or display of Islam in the form of, of a headscarf is a sign of proselytism or of poor assimilation or a sign of some dual loyalty has, I think, really affected and shaped public attitudes toward Islam and in particular toward hijabi women. Um, so at the time of the Maryam Pujtu controversy, I was chatting with some friends of mine, other foreign journalists, a number of whom are American, but not exclusively. And we all kind of thought that the controversy, which at that point had gone into its third week, there were still opinion articles about Maryam Pujtu, about the UNEF, the student union, um, we thought it was kind of absurd. Uh, we, especially when we saw high level government officials like the interior minister, who's the person in charge of fighting radicalization, compare a 19 year old literature major engaged in campus life to the young radicals who join the Islamic State. Um, and so as a result, we all kind of wrote the same article about the incident. Uh, and our conclusion was that controversy after controversy, this issue clearly isn't getting resolved, and that laïcité, this French secularism, has, in the context of after the French after the attacks that hit France in 2015 and 2016, kind of become wrapped up in these larger anxieties over identity and over Islam and over radicalization. Um, and I think that there are some clear examples of how, and I don't know if they are a direct result of this law, um, but there are, I think, clear examples, quantifiable examples of how there is something of a climate of fear um, toward Islam in, in French society today. Um, and I think that that climate is only deepened by social media and the echo chambers it creates, um, where people can kind of affirm their own visions without talking to people on the other side. Um, so, but just to, to give some examples, uh, according to a 2016 survey, um, the majority of the French population wildly overestimates the size of the Muslim community. They place it at 31%, um, when in reality is an es it is at an estimated 8%. France does not take racial or ethnic statistics, but the estimates place it at 8%. Um, and this living there really surprised me, the frequency with which I saw um, surveys and op-eds and nightly talk shows asking whether Islam is compatible with the Republic. Um, a survey from two months ago indicated that 60% of the population does not think that it is. How much we trust surveys, etc., is maybe another, another conversation. Um, over the summer, and this has continued until relatively recently, there was a national debate over whether mothers who wear the hijab can accompany their children on school field trips. Um, and so a lot of people, I think, had hoped that Emmanuel Macron would kind of temper these debates. Um, and he has to a certain extent, but in a recent interview with a magazine, he said that he did not think that um, the headscarf was compatible with the civility of our country and lamented that many young women who wear the hijab are the children and grandchildren of immigrants rather than recent arrivals. And he attributed that to the failure of the French integration model. Um, and so this was kind of the context that we, I and other foreign reporters saw this controversy unfolding. Um, and so we all wrote this article kind of to, to that effect, basically saying what I've just presented to you. And then we all face this wave of backlash against our article. Um, on Twitter, in the French media, there were, there were entire articles written about our articles. It was just this kind of ridiculous, um, you know, media conversation about itself. There was one article called Why the American Press Totally Misses the Point When It Criticizes France. 
And, and that's fair enough. Um, I've just spent the past however long, 10, 15 minutes talking about how I understood these debates in France from an American perspective. I grew up in the US. Um, and it's clear that in France there are, there's a different, there's a view of US conversations about diversity and religion and religious freedom that, that there's kind of a, a big gap between the way that the two nations define religious freedom and what it means to exist as, as a united nation. Um, and so I didn't really try to kind of come up with an answer to which model is better. Is the French model better than the American model? I don't know. But what my research did kind of make me think about was national myths and the stories that nations tell themselves. Um, and laïcité and French secularism is can't be separated from the way that France perceives itself as a nation. Um, this kind of universalist idea of everyone is at first and foremost French before any other form of particular identity. And in the US, that's, that's less the case. Um, France sees itself as colorblind. There are no racial statistics. And in the US, we're this multicultural society um, with, with affirmative action, which everyone I spoke to in France thinks is not everyone, but a lot of people I spoke to in France thinks is kind of a, a strange concept that shows that the U.S. is too fixated on race, and that's why we have so much racial animus in this country. Um, but the fact of the matter is, is that in both societies, intolerance has become a major feature of contemporary politics. Um, and in France, as much as there is this kind of narrative of colorblindness and of being a post-racial society, there are major inequalities on religious and ethnic lines. Um, police stop Arabs and blacks 20 times more than they do whites. Stop and frisk is routine practice. Um, and discrimination in the workplace and housing market is rampant. And these constant controversies do, I think, among many French Muslims, contribute to a sense that they are discriminated against. Um, there's an anecdote from a sociologist by the name of Jean Bobereau, who's a specialist on laïcité. And I, I think this kind of story he, he once told sums it up nicely. He recalled during a conference uh, on minorities at UNESCO, um, the French representative on the stage proudly claimed that minorities do not exist in France. And an academic sitting next to him in the audience kind of chuckled um, and, and nudged Jean Bouberot, the sociologist, and said, yes, like in Iran, where there aren't any homosexuals. Um, and, you know, I think that that is kind of maybe an extreme example, but this idea that France is a multicultural society that is struggling to embrace, or that for a number of reasons, good or bad, does not want to embrace the language of multiculturalism, has kind of come to, has really kind of crystallized and come to um, a point of, of tension today, um, and especially in the, in the past several years. And so it's not just Jean Bobero, the sociologist, or foreign correspondents like me and the others who wrote this highly provocative, apparently, article about Marianne Pouchetou that are kind of questioning these, this narrative about race and religion and identity. There's increasingly a new younger generation of activists that drawing on lessons from the US civil rights movement, et cetera, is kind of more actively questioning um, this, this narrative. And they have butt heads with the establishment um, to a great extent. Um, there's a, a woman, a sociologist and an activist who I interviewed a couple times during my fellowship by the name of Nasira Genif. Um, and she's in her 60s now. She's French Algerian. Um, and I think that the way that she described it to me kind of sums it up nicely that France is a multicultural society that doesn't think of itself as multicultural. Um, and she said that her generation was quiet and she kind of reflected on this reflex she had growing up to always apologize for her origins, that she'd enter a room and kind of quietly say, my name is Nasira, but it's, it's okay, um, don't worry. And that now there's kind of a realization that that strategy didn't work. Um, and as she sees it, the establishment is afraid. Um, there's a lot else that I would like to get into. Um, as, as Greg said, my fellowship kind of offered me avenues to explore the ways that this has affected different parts of society, um, this, this ongoing conversation. Um, but that's one of the greatest things about the ICWA fellowship, I think, is the way that it really lets you follow 
the tangents of any given subject. Um, so I arrived having with, with two years in front of me to explore this topic and I was able to interview students in schools who grew up with this 2004 law and religious signs on the book to kind of understand how they saw the law. I was able to interview people on both sides of the spectrum. Um, and I think that that's something that the ICWA Fellowship really offers that is a rare opportunity. Um, so I would love for you, if you had any questions um, about my research, I'm happy to answer them, yes. Thanks. Thank you very much. Excellent presentation. My name is Leo Pajdovic. I'm the co-chair of the U.S. Europe Alliance. Um, I usually don't deal with <clears throat> things, you know, regarding French internal politics, but I have a question for you uh, regarding France's um, Islam, view on Islam, uh, domestically and how it feeds into their foreign policy. Mm -hmm. uh, as you might know, uh, President Macron has uh, given a highly controversial interview to the Economist, mm -hmm. in which he said something that escaped, sort of, sort of, it was erased from the debate, uh, mostly in the West, but made waves in the Western Balkans, which is where I'm originally from, where he said that Bosnia is a, and I quote, a jihadi time bomb. Yeah. Now, if you know the context for you know us, you know white European Muslims who've always been there, which is a very different context than European immigrants having in the societies they come from. It, it was, I mean, it's hard to over, overestimate how negative the comment was and, and how negatively it was perceived, especially having in mind that François Mitterrand is you know on the record saying that Bosnia yes, during the war in the 90s France was heavily on the uh, Milosevic's side. And François Mitterrand said that Bosnia would not belong because it would be the only Muslim nation in Europe. So my question to you, is Macron's uh, foreign policy, which is very focused for some reason on Islam, an extension of the debate that you just talked about, which is what some of the analysts have been saying, or is it something completely different? Thank you very much. That's a really interesting question. I Certainly the tone of that comment um, that he let slip in, in the Economist interview, um, the kind of language of saying it's a jihadi time bomb is consistent, I think, with the, these domestic debates. I wonder the extent to which any French president right now could not focus on at least, I don't know about Islam, but at least on Islamism in, in French foreign policy, um, given that, that France has had such a problem with Islamist terrorism um, in the past several years. Um, but, you know, it's hard, it's, it's hard to say. I think that, that it happened. What's Bosnia got to do with it? I mean, everybody knows the comment is, is, is a lie. Yeah. There's no, there's right. no proof of that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think that it's hard to say. Like, like I said, I think that a lot of people thought that Macron would kind of temper these debates um, that were particularly contentious during the previous administration because that's when the majority of the terrorist attacks had hit. And obviously during Nicolas Sarkozy's, he kind of raised this whole question of national identity to begin with and of integration to begin with. I think that also right now, Macron is kind of making a lot of electoral calculations in the lead up to the municipal elections in March and notably kind of projecting to 2022 when there will be the next elections. And so maybe taking that kind of firmer tone is something he thinks will, will, gain, will gain voters um, from the right, potentially. But I, I don't know enough about his internal <laughs> calculations. Uh, I, I read that it was very, very difficult for Islamic people who <coughs> immigrated to France even second and third generations to find jobs. Mm. Is that true? And and even though they've got French citizenship, it is very difficult for them to find work. 
So I, there is a good deal of workplace discrimination. Um, because France doesn't take racial or religious statistics, it's difficult to act to quantify it, but there has been there's been an, a good amount of research done kind of with testing. So for example, they'll send two resumes to a number of, of hiring of companies that are hiring that are identical and one person is named Mohammed and the other person is named Jacques or something. Um, and I think that Jacques gets hired at a rate 20 times higher than Mohammed despite having the exact same qualifications. Um, so yes, there is discrimination. I'm Catherine Riley, and I am a friend of ICWA. And I would like to ask if you think that civility, the term which Macron used in his statement that Islam is not compatible with the civility of our country, if that is the appropriate sort of objective of the narrative. And I want to make a parallel with the US. And I think we need to be very careful about not acting superior to the French in terms of Islamophobia and racism because we have a long way to go, and there's a lot of talk these days um, with which I agree about the importance of civility between the Democrats and the Republicans. And while civility, and that's the key word, is civility, and I recently um, heard an African-American leader speak, and she raised the question of whether civility is our goal. Perhaps it's, it should be the rights of all, and you know, essentially respect for other human beings and not just this white Christian American or French civility. So the question is, you know, what, what should be the goal? And when you mention this young uh, movement in France, I assume people who uh, aspire to the Martin Luther King era, are they talking about um, a sort of, do they have a different narrative? I mean, I try to trust they do. And could you just elaborate some on that narrative? Yeah, um, that's that's an interesting question. I think that everybody has the same stated goal, which is social cohesion, um, or vivre ensemble, is living together is the way that it's often discussed in France. Um, I think that the younger generation of activists and this new movement is trying to promote a vision of society that celebrates difference in a way that maybe Macron's notion of civility or what the kind of French universal model um, doesn't necessarily see as productive or, or something that kind of makes people get along. Um, so to, to give a more concrete example, I did a number of interviews in, in public schools and I spoke to a lot of young students, many of whom came from Muslim families, some of whom didn't, um, but these, you know, they're 16 years old, they were, they have only gone to school with this law on the books. And a lot of them said, I went on a school trip to the UK, or I went on a school trip to the US, I guess less the US, but they, they more, they said they went on a school trip to London, and they saw police officers wearing a hijab. Um, and they thought, well, oh, what if I want to be a police officer? Um, <laughs> would I be able to hear if, if I wanted to keep wearing a hijab? And that there they didn't see why, they, they, they saw that as an example of why growing up with people around you who look different and that being something to be celebrated rather than considered out of line with the civility of, of the nation as something that was had a positive effect on, on society rather than a negative one. Um. I think we can take one last question before we start the panel discussion. I have a question about debate in France and the terms of the debate. Yeah. Um, does anyone argue that Islam as a religion of holy law is very different from Christianity as a religion of faith? And that difference makes Islam inherently political? Or does that never come up? A lot of people are, make that argument. That I, I think that that's something that a lot of the people who took issue with using Mariam Pouchtou as this example, taking issue with the fact that a student union president would wear a hijab, um, there's, it's often, people often say that Islam is not a religion like any other, that is inherently a political system, and so it needs to be approached in a, in a different way than, than other religions in France. And I think they use 
the rise of political Islam as a way to kind of substantiate that claim. The majority of the French Muslims I interviewed do not see their Islam, their faith, as something that goes any, that, that exceeds the bounds of faith. Um, I talked to, to nobody who said that they view going to mosque and praying or wearing whatever they choose to wear as an expression, as a political expression. Um, Well, I'll go up to the, uh, to okay. the, to the we'll start with the panel discussion then. Karina, thank you uh, so much. That was, uh, that was terrific. Um, now I'd like to introduce our panel on migration and identity politics. Uh, our moderator, Pascal Sora, is a trustee of the Institute of Current World Affairs, as I've said, uh, and a senior knowledge and learning officer at the World Bank. He's also a former cultural and education advisor with the Embassy of France in the United States, uh, and also once ran this uh, institution, the Alliance Française in Washington. So I can think of one, nobody better to moderate this discussion. Pascal. Um, thank you very much, Gregory, for this kind introduction. Uh, and uh, it's my turn now to, to thank the Alliance Française again and to, to thank her executive director, Sarah Diligenti, uh, her deputy director, Amene Majlesi, and our event co coordinator, Natasha Zavatskaya. I'm uh, absolutely delighted to be back here. It's been my home for many happy years, and uh, I cannot think of a better way to come back uh, for a moment uh, than this event. Uh, and so we'll, we'll kick it off with, uh, with a panel discussion with uh, two great guests today, Maria Politzer and Jean-Benoît Nadeau. I'm going to ask them to please uh, move forward and maybe take a seat here while I'm moving the lectern. Uh, our first panelist is uh, Maria Politzer. Uh, she's an award-winning long-term journalist who specializes in international development, uh, human rights issues, and investigative reporting. She was recently awarded with an Elian Overseas Press Club Award for refugee reporting in Europe, Africa, and the Middle East. For three years, she worked as a feature writer at Mint, India's second largest financial newspaper. She recently completed a two-year writing fellowship with the Institute of Current World Affairs, which explained uh, that we have the pleasure of our company today. And she uh, spent her fellowship in India, where she wrote about border issues and religious conflict, and in, in Spain. Uh, so she published our articles in the Huffington Post Highline, The Economist, The Wall Street Journal, Vogue India, to name a few. So welcome, Maria, and uh, we're delighted to have you today. And our second panelist is uh, Jean-Benoît Nadeau, uh, an habitué uh, de l'Alliance Française. Jean-Benoît is a regular contributor to L'Actualité and a columnist with Le Devoir. He is among the few Canadian journalists who publish in French and in English in uh, no other publication than the New York Times, the International Herald Tribune, or the Toronto Star. In 1998, uh, Nadeau won a fellowship from the Institute of Current World Affairs to study France. And that worked, uh, because shortly after the fellowship, he published with his wife and writing partner, Julie Barlow, whom we have the pleasure to have here today. Uh, it's a great, I, I didn't know this, but it's, a, it, it's quite a, a treat then to, to have you with Jean-Benoît. Uh, and they, they published 60 million Frenchmen can be wrong. Uh, pour un coup d'essai, ce fut un coup de maître. Uh, the book was universally praised and has sold 200,000 copies in five languages, including Mandarin. That's good for French culture. <laughs> <laughs> So Julie and Jean-Benoît have toured extensively in the Alliance Française Network and around the world to support their bestsellers and many subsequent publications, among which The Story of French in 2006, The Story of Spanish in 2013, and uh, because the love affair with France was not over, they went back in 2013 and 2014, uh, which gave way to a book, The Bonjour Effect, The Secret Codes of French Conversation Revealed. I read it, it's good, and it's accurate. It was published in 2016. It explores how the French talk about small things and big issues about themselves and the world. Uh, it's quite a great book. I highly recommend it. I had my two French copy autographed just an hour ago. So uh, we are here at the Alliance Française, uh, which beyond hosting this panel discussion also promotes cultural diversity, as you know, and the values of tolerance and openness. Uh, this generous stance 
has often been a claim not only of the Alliance Francaise, of course, but also of France, uh, Patrie des Droits de l'Homme. It has recently been stress tested by the influx of migrants and an increasingly difficult debate uh, around what it means to welcome others. And so today uh, we will circle around the topics and the, the, the speech that Karina just uh, gave. We'll talk about migration, we'll talk about immigration. Uh, so, and because the Equa Fellowship are about embedding observers in foreign culture, there is a meta quality to this panel. Uh, it is composed of three voluntary and temporary immigrants uh, who had to navigate otherness and what it means to be wanted or unwanted somewhere. So I would like to kick it off and ask Malia and Jean Benoit what the Equa Fellowship meant to them and uh, what, they, what was their most striking experience to become a stranger in a foreign land. So Malia, if you, if you would like to start with this. Oh. Hmm. Well, for me, the, the ICWA Fellowship, um, I think as a writer, was really, really influential because it allowed me the space to really work um, on my writing, which I really appreciated, and also to kind of sit with people who I didn't have to, I didn't have to kind of make news deadlines, because before I was working at a daily news uh, paper in India, as, as you mentioned, and you always had to, to kind of be like looking for stories that had kind of immediate interest for the daily headlines. And so I think being able to sit with somebody who um, has no relevance to the news, but, but sit with them and really have a conversation without the need for that instant publication really gives you a level of depth of a place that otherwise you wouldn't have. Um, and it's interesting you say, say um, being welcome or unwelcome was actually I, my, my first, I was originally applied for India and I ended up um, not being able to go back after I came back to renew my visa because of some of the, the ICWA reporting, I think, that happened uh, in the Northeast, and that's how I ended up in Spain, actually, where I'm currently living. Um, in Spain, in some ways, it's interesting because in some ways, I had already been living in India for a while and uh, felt quite comfortable there, so I didn't get that kind of, this is a new place experience that I had. Um, because I'd, I'd been there, as an ICWA fellow, when I went to India, I had been there already. So it wasn't new to me. I'd been there for, for almost two and a half years. But in Spain, it was different for me because everything looked quite familiar. It looked very much like the United States from what, different parts of the United States. But I could tell, and from talking to people, there was a real difference that, that took a little bit more for me to... Huh? Yeah. Mm. It's not the mic, it's not the rest of the camera. It's oh. oh, okay. When we move backwards, that may work if you want to enjoy the speaker. Yeah, we have lots of them. Sorry, technicality. No, no problem. Let's do a second tag then. Let's try again. <laughs> okay, is this better? We'll try. Okay, is this better? Yeah, much better. Oh, do I? I don't think I have it with me. Yeah. No, it's in, it's in my bag over there. Try not to find the speakers. That would help. Okay. So these are the speakers. Try to. Like Is that better? Yeah. Okay. That sounds perfect. Great. Yeah. So um, it was really when I when I went to Spain that I had that experience of of being. I mean, I've been living in India before, so it was a little bit different, but things looked very, very familiar to me. And so it took a little bit more, and I already spoke Spanish, but starting to, to see the differences from, I guess, my kind of expectation of what I would find and uh, what I did find, it required a little bit more just spending time and talking with people. And I'm still living there today, so obviously it, it stuck really well. But it's been a really, for me, I think writing was the experience that I had the best time with because I was able to really focus on honing the craft and also having those kinds of conversations. Actually, one of the ones that you are going to be asking me about with some of the anecdotes of people that I got to meet was really nice. Excellent. Thank you very much. Jean-Benoit? The, the, uh, the, the fellowship was an opportunity to, to get um, out of Quebec. Quebec is a spur I was a journalist and Quebec is a very small market within Canada, so I had the opportunity, thanks to the fellowship, to to, to uh, French is my mother tongue, and, and so I had to do the double exercise of understanding the French and understanding Americans because I was writing to an American institute. So I was doing an exercise that was both ways all the time. 
was a great thing, a great, uh, uh, great occasion. And I, uh, as a fellow, my, my the, the, the topic I'd given myself was why the French resist globalization, which after two weeks realized that they don't realize that they don't resist at all. <laughs> and I found myself without a topic, so I decided to study why we ask silly questions about the French and keep asking them. And uh, much of the, the following books was about that, uh, about explaining the French in their own terms rather than foreign terms. You know, even a term like uh, unemployment, for example, even if it seems objective, doesn't compare because the way it's defined between countries is not the same. So you cannot say, oh, they're doing this much better or worse because they have this much or less of unemployment. It doesn't compare. It can only be understood within the country. Um, my first impression, it's actually the director of the, at the time was Peter, um, Peter Martin. He said to me two things. He said, he said keep your receipts. <laughs> and he also said, uh, cultivate your first impressions. You will only have them once. Uh, so I did something I never did before, which was keep a journal. And uh, amongst the early things we did, we were living briefly in the, the 20th arrondissement. Smyrna. I went to visit the mosque. It was kicked out. You know, they realized that I was a journalist. Everybody was welcome, but they kicked me out. And they, they kicked me out for my own, good, my own good, because some people could be rough with me, naturally. They were rough kicking me out. But anyway, uh, that was my, my contact. And uh, the, other, the other thing I'm, 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 I'm keeping with, with, uh, with the topic we have, I had a lot more first impressions than that. But another uh, thing that struck me was uh, in conversation and in the newspapers, the fact that um, integration of immigrants was a political taboo. It was a topic that you didn't discuss. It was actually only the, the extreme right that raised that issue of the problem of integrating immigrants. Uh, it was against the political culture to discuss that topic. That struck me because it's actually a very normal topic of conversation in Montreal or here. You know, integration of immigrants, some have trouble, some have this trouble, and you discuss that. In France, that topic was taboo, and uh, that struck me a lot. And, and Julia and I worked a lot in understanding why this was so, and, a lot of our books turn around those topics. I'll stop here for I'll stop here for the moment. Thank you, Jean-Benoît. Very good. Uh, and uh, before we go back to integration and immigration, let, let's talk then about migration. Uh, I would like to to ask another question to to Maria. Uh, um, reflecting on a, an article you wrote uh, a few years ago for the uh, Huffington Post. Uh, it, was, it was a long form article, uh, really well written, beautiful pictures too. You follow the migration trail from Niger to Italy, to Turkey, to Germany, and you uh, uncovered doing so the exploitation of the migrant crisis, which culminated in your article uh, with what you described in Germany as the crisis going corporate. C can, you, can you please tell us a little more about you, your finding and, uh, and what you, you observed in Germany, not, not yeah. really? Yeah, so um, basically when we got to Germany, so, so just kind of a little bit more background on, on the larger piece, we looked at um, the people who are kind of making money, who are fin making financial gain off of the refugee crisis. So in Niger we looked at um, the smuggling economy and the smugglers and how that worked and how much they were making and how they were, how they were benefiting from this. And then when, in Turkey we kind of looked at the gray market economy and how refugees were being absorbed and who did, mostly didn't have work permits, and, and so how they navigated that and the, the different, um, primarily like cloth um, fabric, I don't know why I'm thinking in Spanish, but that were the, the factories that were employing them at very low wages. And then in Italy, it was looking at the mafia, and then of course in, in Germany, we're looking at the corporatization and specifically privatization of um, refugee care and the refugee kind of integration in the direct wake of the, the refugee crisis. And so just for some, some background for that, um, I'm sure a lot of you remember the, the now infamous speech that Merkel gave in, in 2014, kind of opening Germany up to uh, immigration, which is a very nice thought, right? I mean, there was a big crisis, uh, people needed a place to go, and, and they were trying to take the moral high ground by inviting people in and saying, okay, well, the double convention, which uh, basically means that people are supposed to ask asylum in the first country they land in, in Europe, that we won't be looking at the double convention. So if someone gets to Germany, we'll let you in, we'll, we'll give you safe passage. 
And of course that led to all of you know, the, the press coverage, I'm sure all of you saw, of the, the inundated train stations and all that, um, that that happened in the wake of that. So we went actually a couple years later, we did our reporting in 2016 to see, okay, well, like in the wake of that, how, how, how has it been? Like how was that process? And um, we did reporting in Berlin as kind of a microcosm of what was happening in the rest of Germany. And at the height of it, there were I think a thousand people a day who were arriving, which was a complete logistical nightmare for the local government. Uh, but to try to then figure out where are they gonna be staying? I mean, this was a lot of people coming in the dead of winter. Um, their, their emergency shelters were immediately overwhelmed. And so uh, they ended up having to suspend the traditional no-bid contracting, which is the way that they would usually do it, just because they need people in shelters now, or you would have you know, elderly pregnant women, children out on the streets in the snow. And so they started by basically um, opening up gymnasiums, they contacted all of the NGOs that had worked with, with uh, migrants or refugees. That was exhausted within, within really days, within weeks. Then they started uh, approaching all of the kind of smaller companies that did things like um, home, running homeless shelters, that were running um, home service, health services, that sort of thing, and that was overwhelmed. And so then they actually had a, a desk where they just started cold calling businesses that were tangentially related to anything having to do with social services. So I actually visited this guy, Rife Kuhert, who um, prior to getting this call from Legesso, which is the department in Berlin which was responsible for trying to find shelter for people, had been running a job center. He had no experience whatsoever running any kind of shelter for, that would, people would have to live in for any period of time. And he got this call and said, um, would you be interested in running a refugee shelter? He said, um, okay, well, you know, he knew that it was really a need. He said, okay. He said, okay, well, you have 30 minutes uh, to go look at the site. Can you go there right now? Like, we'll meet you there. Okay. Three hours later, he was running not just one, but two shelters with 600 people, double the amount that they were supposed to have, and he would be in charge of that with no experience for months, um, close to a year, actually. So that's kind of the situation that Germany was in at that time. So there's kind of two, two periods of time, uh, two, two waves. There was the immediate wave of, of just everyone trying to kind of capitalize on this emergency. Not everybody, some people were, a lot of the companies were really trying to do their very, very best. But there were, of course, like one of the other ways that the government was trying to get people out of the cold was issuing these vouchers, these 50 euro vouchers, that then people could take to a traditional hotel or hostel in exchange for a bed. So they would give, this person is you know, waiting for Legesso. Once they established that, okay, you were an asylum seeker, take this voucher. And so then overnight, you saw um, basically people having these handwritten signs from their, their windows saying that people could come to their house and they put into bunk beds, um, kind of like an Airbnb for refugees almost. And then people would be trying to, to kind of cash in on that. So, so one of the government people that I, I interviewed actually thought that in that initial phase, Germany probably overspent by 100 million um, euro because of kind of not managing that initial, that initial wave properly. And the second one was just more, um, a bit more organized as when the larger corporates started to come into it. And that's where you had, um, there's this airport called Tempelhof Airport, it's a Nazi era airport in uh, Berlin, that they basically were trying to figure out, well, how can we have a more, a much larger uh, space for refugees to go into? And so they opened, decided that we'll turn this into a refugee shelter. It was not, of course, designed to be a refugee shelter, so there were a lot of problems with having enough uh, bathrooms and all that sort of thing. But then they started approaching these larger corporates, and one of the big ones was um, European Home Care. Um, and there are a few others, but that was the one that we were kind of investigating in this piece. Um, and they took over the, the management of this, basically, and, and, and um, they were basically ended up spending, I think they charged, I can't quite remember, I think it was like 11 or, or 22 euro per person, which was a lot less than what the government had been previously spending, so it seemed really good, and they said they could do this by economies of scale. But um, a lot of human rights activists and also a lot of the asylum seekers that we interviewed um, said that the reason, that what way that they thought they were making money off of it was just by really cutting costs. So um, there was a lot of lack of shampoo, um, there were a lot, of, a lot of lack of toilet paper, of baby products. Uh, and so they really came under fire for human rights abuses. Um, anyway, I know I'm running on for a while, but, but basically now um, the other, you're not seeing, now that people are out 
out of the emergency shelters, the, the new wave of kind of corporatization of uh, the refugee crisis in Europe. Well, in Germany specifically, it's integration services, which I think is actually a lot more better managed now because I think a lot of the exploitation that happened in the first wave was because of lack of government oversight. And now um, they've had kind of chance to kind of get to speed on what's happening and there has been a lot more government oversight, but I think the next wave that uh, needs to be investigated now, and I'm actually starting to do this with a colleague, is the externalization of borders into um, North and Central Africa. And the, the companies, like security companies, that are have gotten multi-billion dollar contracts doing that. So I think that's the next wave that would be really interesting to look further into. Thank you very much, yeah. Maria. Thank you uh, for this uh, interesting account and uh, talking, uh, walking us through your, your journey and the journey of those migrants. Uh, Karina, you had your own encounter with uh, with migrants, and uh, speaking of borders, um, you uh, you actually travelled to Gap during your fellowship, and you attempt, attended the trial of seven migrant rights act activists. Uh, they were dubbed the Briançon Seven. Uh, they were facing up to ten years in prison, and they were charged last December uh, with lighter sentences, but which uh, were seen as still unusually harsh. Could you please describe uh, for us the tensions that you witnessed and the, the public debate surrounding the trial in, in France? Yeah. yeah, I attended the trial last year of seven migrants' rights activists, advocates who, so just to give context on the trial, they, they had been charged with facilitating the illegal border crossing of 10 or 20, it was kind of unclear, um, migrants and asylum seekers. Um, which is illegal um, in, in France to help people cross the border illegally. Um, and the context in which they did that was last April, uh, this far-right group called Génération Identitaire, which is part of the larger identitarian movement, often referred to as the alt-right, um, had staged massive protests and blockades on the French-Italian border. Um, they got had a good amount of money and were able to hire helicopters and dressed in matching uniforms and blocked the border and put big signs saying migrants go home. Um, and so these activists staged a march in response to this massive blockade of the border and in so doing walked across the border from Italy to France and were accused of doing that as a ruse to bring illegal or without migrants without papers across the border. Um, and so I attended that trial. Um, and it was this, it was in this small town in France, but the issues that were raised are really fundamental for, for Europe more broadly. It was this kind of question of, can we maintain open borders within the European Union at a moment where migration is causing such political tension? Um, and also this, the duality of, of the, the trial, these migrants' rights activists being tried who were retaliating against the blockade of the border staged by, identitarian, uh, by an identitarian group. Um, so that was a really interesting thing to witness. Um, Thank you. Thank you very much for, for, for that, Karina. And migrations are believed to ultimately benefit recipient countries. Uh, there is right now a Venezuelan crisis, as you know, and it's been calculated that uh, Colombia might be better off for these migrants who are young and uh, who are educated. But uh, somehow, in spite of this uh, rational understanding of what migration brings to a country, um, the immediate reaction, of course, is uh, xenophobia. And uh, this is heightened when uh, those migrants might become immigrants. And so uh, there's the whole question of how we accept the other. And Karina talked about this a little bit, uh, but I would like Jean-Benoit now to, to, to tell us a little bit about his finding and his reflection uh, in his latest book, The Bonjour Effect, on, uh, on how France is uh, actually seeing the other. Um, you, you isolated by ba basically three uh, main components. The first one is the, the assimilation or integration of foreigners. The second is a, an endemic defiance vis-à-vis -vis ethnic communitarianism. And the third one is the defense of laicity. 
which uh, you define, uh, and I love that expression, borrowing from Diogier, as freedom from religion. So could you tell us uh, how you saw this concept help, or on the contrary, complicate the discourse about immigration? Um, I, I, my impression, in fact, that there's, there's, there's um, a lot more complicating factors than just those three elements. And, and, and one, one is the fact that for the last 50, 60, 70 years, um, the French have developed a certain level of political correctness that is theirs, that is, for example, criticizing Europe was forbidden in the press, or you didn't do that because of that was for the far right. You would not express probably nationalism. You would not, which we can think of as a patriotism. We, we take this as a normal, as North American, as something normal to express. But in France, like in most of Europe, that is repressed. It's done in public at the Bastille Day Parade, and that's about it, you know, except at uh, uh, Front National meetings, and now it's called the Rassemblement National, it's not even the Front, it's the Rassemblement, the National Rally. But other than that, people don't wave flags. Uh, so there's, there's a number of things that we take for granted of identity politics and nationalism, uh, how we oppose our country to multilateral institutions, especially when they created, having created Europe. So all this discourse that is critical of, of the other or, or that is affirming who, who we are as an identity was recuperated by the Front National. And they're the only ones who, who, who were talking about that openly, poorly, but they did uh, to the point that even in the 80s, uh, Prime, Minister, Prime, Prime, Prime Minister Fabius, Laurent Fabius, in a debate said the Front National is asking the right questions and provides the wrong answers. Uh, and he was criticized for even having said that. But it, was, it, 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 is, it, is, it is abnormal in a society like France to have integrated the European Union. It was called the European Community for before that, it had various names, and not to have been able to debate openly about what it did to France. And so, so that, that level of discourse was completely repressed. And, uh, and uh, this has increased a lot of, a lot of uh, pressure in the pot of identity because, because there's got to be an outlet somehow. And uh, so now there's other things. I mean, they see right? freedom from religion as opposed to here freedom of religion. Um, Catholicism in France was extremely hard and anti-democratic. It, it wanted to break the institutions of the Republic many times, and it did. They succeeded in that during World War II. They took uh, some groups of people, not just Catholics, but they were they were a big, a, a strong part of it. Seized the opportunity of a political crisis as a, as a result of the defeat of the Battle of France, and they took power, and they had four years of fascist regime. Um, so when the when the when that period ended, they said no more. They said we're going to be hard with the city, and it's going to be very very doctrinarian on that topic, and and. They stay is often criticized, but um, it's uh, for them. It's actually something that they turned against themselves. I mean, now it has been recuperated in the discourse over Islam and the place of Islam in France. But um, a lot of the, the of, of the discourse is against Catholics. And someone, may, I, I was fascinated by an article of a group of scholars who made. Um, a study of all the covers of Charlie, Charlie Hebdo, mm -hmm. famous publication. They, 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 they went over 538. 350 of them were about the European Union and French businesses. 38 were about religion. Uh, 21 about Catholicism and 7 about Islam. So even that publication, which is, which is uh, very Hard actually went very little against it, and primarily against Catholicism. And this must not be forgotten. The other thing, the other complicating factor, which uh, uh, that, that I think is very important, is that the the French have a job in any country. Integration is done through the job market. 
That's how people get integrated primarily. The French have a, have a, 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 a job system that they want to be tight. They want it to be not fluid because for them, what's important is a 40-hour job with all the, all the social protection. And so entering the job market in France for anyone, even the French, is hard. The, 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 the French are, the, the children are protected from the job market. The families keep them until 22, 23, 24, 25 to get the maximum effect on their diploma and their studies in order to get the best job they can to play themselves exactly at the highest possible point. You meet barbers that have a child that went to five years of university and never worked in a McDonald's or at the at the convenience store or anywhere. Never worked because everything is about getting the best results from your diploma and you so so naturally, immigrants and that start at a disadvantage. Uh, and, and they start at a disadvantage everywhere, <laughs> really. Uh, uh, but in a system where jobs have to be in a, are set critical and ever difficult to enter, the job market is difficult to enter, it's particularly hard. And that doesn't favor immigration. The French um, also, I spoke with demographers and, and and uh, demographics in France are positive. The French have made children. Their demography is very good. 75 years ago, it was not very good, but now it is very good. And even, even if uh, they were uh, as welcoming as they used to be 75 years ago, the issue is right now that they need less immigrants. They need less than they used to. And so, naturally, there's more people who want to come in as, as ever, but there's less room. The, the, you go, I, I come in from a society in Quebec where we, we have the same uh, birth, birth rates as Italy and Spain, and we see the country aging every, almost every month. You see people, you walk in the street, and France, between, I was there in 1999 and 2015, I swear there was more people in the street. There's more people. There's just more. The, 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 the French have made babies and they continue to have to have to, 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 to grow. And in Europe we actually have a line from France, uh, Denmark, uh, uh, Belgium, uh, all the way to Scandinavia, the diagonal line, this is positive birth rate or close. And south of it is 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 is, is not replace non-replacement. And this this um, produces, this has an effect on the attitude on towards immigration and the discourse, just because the simple demographics of it. I'll stop here. Thank you, Jean Benoit. Thank you very much. Um, uh, and moving through Europe, Maria, um, you, you, you witnessed the immigration and integration uh, in, in Spain. So you had an interesting article. Um, it was actually a story for me, for it was a, the post, uh, where you were talking about the story of Pilar from uh, Albuñuelas, uh, who rescues uh, Moroccan immigrants. And earlier this, re this year, uh, in an article with Foreign Policy, that was Spanish nationalists hate separatists, not immigrants. You argued that Spain shows more tolerance for immigrants than the rest of Europe. So <clears throat> why do you think that is? And, and are we holding a, a good model here for how to, to welcome others? Thank you. Um, I wouldn't necessarily say that Spain holds more tolerance than, than the rest of Europe. I think that what you do see is, um, until very recently, actually until last month, <laughs> Spain has had a, a notable lack of any kind of far-right party that capitalizes on this issue. It just hasn't really been a talking point in politics. And if you poll most Spanish people, even um, at the height of the economic crisis, they were not being hostile towards, towards immigrants. Like, that wasn't one of the talking points, which is, I mean, there's been a lot of research on something called the so-called like, Spanish exception, which is what, what this is considered to be, as to why uh, Spain hasn't experienced that sort of uh, xenophobia recently, which is also even more interesting given the fact that there are a couple of factors 
that would make me think that there really would be. Like um, Spain between I think 1990 and 2009 had this huge demographic shift of um, in 1990, uh, 1999, I think migrants were 1.4% of the population, and in 2009 they were 14%. So there was this huge increase of migration to Spain that happened to overlap with one of the worst recent economic crises in history. In 2008, youth unemployment was like 55%. And so usually those sorts of factors together are kind of like rocket fuel for, for far right parties, but that just didn't happen. And so there were all of these scholars saying, well, why didn't this happen? And so there are a few different kind of prevailing theories about why, why it's the case that, and the reason why I'm kind of focusing on, on the lack of the far right is because for this to be a talking point, it has to be on the political agenda. Usually the parties that put immigration um, as a negative on, on the kind of political agenda tend to be on the right. Um, the Partido Popular, which is the kind of has been the mainstream, for a long time Spain had a two-party system that's recently ruptured entirely, but the Partido Popular was the one that might have tried that. But um, one, one of the reasons that you haven't seen that playing is because one of the ways that immigration plays in kind of far-right parties is as a call for nationalism. Like this is kind of the, the straw man against which we unify to uh, be us against this kind of external threat. And, and what's different about Spain is Spain has a very, very salient external threat, or rather internal threat, a very internal threat, which is that it could break apart at any time. But you had the, the Basque separatists who, you know, with ETA for a long time, who were literally blowing things up, trying to get separated. Now you have the Catalan crisis, which is a very, very live and very, um, it's not violent quite. It, it kind of is getting there, but not the way that ETA was, that you have bombings, but you do have these protests that are becoming much, much bigger and, um, and that is kind of what, what people have been focusing on as, as a political talking point of, of this is what we need to, to kind of shut down. Um, the other reason I think that you, you see more of a tolerance is Spain has, has been a, um, a country of immigration for a really long time, and this is where we get to Pilar. Mm -hmm. So Pilar was a woman that I wrote about in one of my ICWA newsletters who was from this uh, little town of Abunuelas. She was 85 when I interviewed her. But her story is really relevant because when she was uh, in her 20s, she was one of these tens of thousands of Spanish people who ended up going to the rest of Europe to be a migrant. So she actually went to France, I can't remember where, someplace in the south, south of France, where she worked uh, picking escarole on these farms and would go, you know, leaving her children behind, just the very typical migrant story and would spend, I mean, and she was very conservative, but because she had that experience, um, when migrants, when she met this migrant man who had, you know, just washed up on, you know, basically come on a patera on one of those little boats, everyone else had died, he was the sole survivor, she was very welcoming to him and really tried to help him to get work because she identified with him. And I think that, that one of the other arguments that they say why Spain has been exceptional in this regard is, is it's still very recent that people have that um, personal kind of family memory because it was their parents, it was their grandparents. But I think now you're seeing a new generation that doesn't have, I mean, now you have the youth who have also, um, are all moving out, but I think now, uh, so in this past, like last month, Spain got its first mainstream far-right party called Vox. It, it um, has a third of the parliamentary seats in Spain, I'm sorry, not the third, it has 15%, but it's the third most uh, important party now in the, in the parliament. And I think what you're seeing now that's different is um, Vox, because, I mean, this is a little bit maybe too granular about the Spanish politics, but for a long time there was a two-party system that broke five years ago, and there's, they've been kind of had these newcomer parties, and they've been really struggling with how to form a government, so they've had to do these re-elections because they just haven't really had a functional government for, for five years. So the last time that the socialist uh, current president had a re-election, Vox came in, I think, and people voted for, I think, partially their frustration because they really managed to, to capitalize on the Catalan issue and say, look, we're going to be intolerant of that. But the other thing that Vox is doing now is trying to own immigration. And that's the first time that we've seen that happening in Spain, where there's a party where this is their talking point. And I think that they're, they're really using the, the exact same rhetoric that you're seeing with a lot of other far-right parties in, in Europe, the same kind of, I mean, they kind of align out of those books where that's becoming an issue. And I think that because people are now in Spain used to, to reading about that in the press from the rest of Europe, it's becoming a very normalized place. So I think that even though the polls aren't reflecting it now, I wonder if we're seeing the end of Spanish exceptionalism now. And I wonder if we're going to see more antagonism towards immigrants than we have in the past. So I don't think that the polls reflect that yet, but I, I think that it might happen soon. So.
Thank you, Mario. Thank you. Yes, and here the unifying factor is the, the fear of losing identity. It's yeah. the, the way you perceive yourself as a, as a nation and as a country. Um, and you, you talked about um, how integration is difficult for, for youth. Karina, you also met with, uh, with younger immigrants uh, and had um, a very touching and interesting article about how um, their identity as youth is recognized or not by the French system. Could you, could you tell us a, a little more about this? Yeah. Um, so on the same research trip um, that I observed, that trial I mentioned, um, I interviewed a number of young teenagers, mostly seeking asylum um, in France, and they had crossed into France through Italy which means that they went through the Alps, and this was in winter, and it's a really difficult journey, as you might imagine. Um, and they were kind of stuck in administrative limbo, and what I looked at is they had claimed to be minors, um, which would afford them specific protections by French law um, and by international law, um, required to provide shelter to uh, someone under 18 claiming asylum. Um, and because of politics, because of administrative backlog, because of the fact that it's difficult to obje objectively assess someone's age, they kind of entered this administrative abyss um, where a lot of their claims of being a minor were denied. Um, in many departments in France, uh, administrations still use bone tests to assess age, um, except bone tests have been completely deemed by all medical authorities in France and abroad as inaccurate um, and kind of an insufficient indicator of age. Um, and so a lot of them based on this basis were denied any protections as minors. In the events where they weren't given a bone test, they were often given very quick interviews um, and they were kind of in a bind. The interviewer would ask, how did you get here? How have you supported yourself? And they say, well, I, I came from Niger and I, and I worked my way up to, up to the north and then I got on a boat and, or I, I went through Libya and in Libya I had to do all of these things in order to find a trafficker to take me to Europe, et cetera, et cetera. And the interviewer would say, no minor could have done that on their own. Um, and so it was a really interesting and kind of these stories were horrible. Um, but it also, if bone tests are inaccurate and these interviews are subjective, it shows that, you know, I mean, a lot of immigration policy is caught up in reactionary politics and, and in, in partisan divides, but there also is a real objective difficulty um, in these assessments and in how to give rights to the people um, to, how to appropriately allocate benefits. Um, it's, it's not a science, it's very difficult. Thank you. Yeah. Still on the topic of identity and uh, maybe the denial of identity mm -hmm. here. Um, <laughs> you, you wrote, Maria, about, uh, and that was a, a very recent work you, you did for the New York Times. Uh, you wrote with Annie Hilton, you described a lot, the lot of LGBTQ refugees. Uh, what, what's remarkable what's tragic is the fact that their struggle starts with the denial of their sexual identity. The translators uh, who are here to help them uh, refuse to translate accurately uh, when they talk about their, their <coughs> sexuality. So t tell us more about what you discovered there. Yeah, thank you. Um, so this is actually, the, the op-ed was um, part of a, a larger piece. We actually traveled to South Africa um, looking at the issue of LGBTI asylum seekers um, kind of from, from Africa and the challenge they have accessing uh, asylum through the entire asylum system. So this, we uh, wrote a long piece, it was like seven, a long piece for, for long reads about this and also the, the way that they weren't able to access um, refugee really services in, in, the, in Europe as well. And then we turned this into an op-ed kind of making an argument for why maybe there should be an exception when, when you look at how um, LGBTI asylum seekers coming from Africa specifically um, are accessing that. And, and I think, so some background would be, is, is good for this. Um, and basically in, in Africa, um, 34 or 54 countries penalize being LGBTI, and that's why we focus on Africa specifically, because I think being LGBTI is difficult in general um, to 
it, it, it was difficult for all refugees, let's just face it. Any asylum seeker trying to get asylum faces a lot. But if you're coming from African LGBTI and you stay in Africa, it's even harder because one of the problems that we saw is people have to, to cross multiple hostile borders before they're able to get to a place where they can actually ask for asylum because more than half of the country in Africa criminalize it in some way, shape, or form, some with the death penalty. So for example, um, this, this guy that we interviewed in South Africa named Amebi, he um, was, uh, had to leave after he was forced to this, um, this kind of forced exorcism to try to get rid of his gayness in his village. It didn't work, so obviously. So he, um, people were trying to kill him and, and he actually fled to a big city and he was followed by people from his village who were actually sent by his father to try to kill him because of the shame that it brought to his family. So he ended up, eventually, um, somebody felt bad for him. He was begging on the streets and gave him enough money to uh, go to South Africa. Because South Africa is one of the places that has become kind of a mecca for people who are LGBTI in the other parts of Africa because it's one of the only places where actually there's protection written into the Constitution. Um, so, but unfortunately, in, in the reality, what we found the reality is that <laughs> they're not really protected there either because South Africa is experiencing this huge wave of xenophobia right now. So like all of these asylum centers have been closed down, there's really only two that work. And when people are trying to access services, since they're so inundated, there's not a lot of private places where they can give their stories. Um, as you mentioned, the translator issue is a big one because a lot of the translators aren't sensitized to these issues. So if they're coming from the same country, which they often are, because that's why they would know the language, right? Where they're trying to translate the story, some, sometimes, in, in several occasions, people have flat out refused to translate. Um, there are cases where people say they're translating, but then when they get their documents back, they see a totally different story that they didn't tell, which obviously compromises their application. So that's an issue. The other issue is that um, the other route that people can take who uh, are LGBT to try to, get, is get, to try to get out of, of, of the continent to, to kind of a safe third party a safe third country elsewhere, um, and that usually go, means going to refugee camps. Uh, and so we spoke to a number of people from Kakuma Refugee Camp, which is in Uganda, sorry, in Kenya, which is one of the, the second largest refugee camp in Kenya. But the problem there, of course, is then you, while people are waiting for their applications to pen, they're, they're in the refugee camp alongside people from a lot of other countries who are hostile and homophobic in the first place. So basically what we saw is kind of a microcosm of what they fled in the refugee camps. And in fact, this, this one transgender woman, Faith, that we spoke to, um, people kind of made almost like a barricade, like the LGBT community there. And they slept in shifts because they were too scared to sleep. So, so they would be watching, because at one point when they had slept, somebody had snuck in and, and vandalized things um, and beat some of them up. So they slept in shifts. Uh, and UNHCR is totally aware of this issue. They actually, after we did the reporting there, created a safe house in Nairobi to uh, try to, to put all the people from the camp because they realized it wasn't safe for them to be there. But obviously that's a really short-term solution because that's not um, something that really, they're experts in, in protecting refugees from other refugees in the camp. So what we wrote in the op-ed as a suggestion is basically that uh, countries that are serious about protecting people who are LGBTI from Africa might consider uh, a, special, a special visa, which the US has done before. Uh, there's something called the Lautenberg Amendment in the 1990s that uh, was passed to try to protect uh, persecuted minorities in Soviet Union, and that was credited with saving, uh, you know, I think more than 100,000 religious minorities, primarily Jews, who were able to come to the United States. And what they were able to do is, is um, just show their membership to uh, a group as opposed to individual persecution. Uh, of course, the problem with LGBT is, is also like, that means that they have to then prove that they're LGBT and improving one's um, sexual orientation is really difficult, which is part of the larger piece that we wrote for, for long reads in Europe, where we saw a lot of um, cultural challenges in terms of how people were being interviewed and their, their ability then to, to kind of perform um, homosexuality or gayness or queerness or whatever, whatever the expectation, like they had to kind of perform to the expectations of the interviewer, where, where we did our, our reporting in the Netherlands. And that was really problematic, and you saw a lot of people, particularly women, women who, many of them had children, um, for various reasons in, in Africa, but for reasons that, that, became, that became an issue when they were then asking for asylum, saying, no, actually, I am, I am a lesbian. In fact, one of the women that we interviewed, uh, Janet, her application was pending for nine years, 
um, in the Netherlands. She's still, like I, I talked to her um, actually a couple weeks ago and she has her, her final meeting coming up and if, if, if they don't give it to her then she'll probably be deported. So it's a really, it's a really big issue. I think that you know, all asylum seekers really struggle but, but people um, who are LGBT have kind of special uh, challenges that, that are a little bit different. So. Thank you very much for that. Thank you. Fascinating, uh, complex, deep issues. Uh, we could actually talk uh, for forever today. But then I would like to, to wrap things up today with uh, one last question for the, the three panelists. Um, and to do so, I, I would like to quote the last few sentences of Jean Benoit's book, uh, Jean Benoit uh, and Judith's book. Um, it, it says, We're certain that there's a French figure out there who is already hammering out some new words and expressions for new concepts that will help the French state overcome its present challenges. You can always count on the French to talk their way out of things. <laughs> so since we are at the Alliance Française, we can probably talk our way out of the, the problem as well. So what I would like to, to ask the three of you, and maybe we'll start with Jean-Benoit. Uh, as journalists, what role can you play, or you think you already played, in responding to the issues we discussed today? Well, I, as a journalist, I, every time I speak with uh, French people on the issue of laicity, I always remind them that um, their laicity, the, in, the, in the discord, they always consider it in the absolute. But in fact, what laicity is, is a gigantic compromise. Uh, you know, Acknowledge that, but you know, I mean, their holidays are religious. Uh, Alsatia and and part of that, the Moselle are in the Concordat, which means that although French schools are officially laic, secular, in those areas they are religious and Catholic. Uh, in within the Republic, uh, so the Republic is perfectly capable of the, making any form of compromise. Uh, it has and it will. So uh, maybe the solution would be uh, to uh, remove uh, two Catholic holidays and say to the uh, the um, the Conseil du Culte Musulman, the 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 Council of the the Muslim Faith, if they have that, they created that entity, and tell them uh, choose a holiday, and then they go to the the Concorde uh, for the the. the, the the consistoire of Hebrew uh, for the, the, the Jews and say choose a holiday and they can fix the problem, it costs nothing. Uh, and it would probably be, uh, the, because the problem is mostly, some, is large, not mostly, is very, symbolics, symbols are very important in the debate. And I think that, you know, I think that um, uh, removing the, the, the emotional charge of the concept of laicity and the fact that the republic is a certain way, which in fact is not, uh, is I think uh, an, an important challenge. And I think the other thing is uh, they all have to find statistical concepts to be able to address the issue. I mean, they're, they're solving the issue of sexism in France because they are allowed to keep statistics on, on, on sexes in France. And right now, they are not allowed to keep statistics on ethnicity or religion for citizens in France. They can for immigrants, because they're, not, they're alien. Uh, they're étranger, and this, this is a terminology. But for the minute a person is a citizen, that's a doctrine of assimilation. They're nothing else but citizen, and they have no religion and no ethnicity. But, but we all know that they do. This, is, this has been the, the topic of the discussion. So the, the, the challenge will be able to in my opinion, right now they're trying to fix a problem for which they have no data. And uh, I, it's also something that I keep repeating. Create the data, find a way, because you're not going to fix the problem. Thank you for that, jean -Bedon. Maria, you want to yeah, answer sure. that question next? Um, so I, um, as somebody, I've been focusing on immigration actually for more than a decade now. And one of the things that I think, uh, with a lot of these conversations about identity, immigration, integration, uh, that a lot of journalists, um, is a challenge with a lot of the journalism right now, and I think I've also fallen into this a lot, is a focus so much on all of the problems, which is important because we need to know what the problems are, but I think that people come away with that with a sense of insecurity and fear that kind of 
plays into this larger kind of populist wave that we're seeing right now where, where immigration is becoming a much larger talking point. I'd like to see more journalism. And one of the reasons we actually did the op-ed is, is trying to come up also with at least highlighting some of the solutions that have been tried and things that people can do about it so people have some place to put that energy, that it doesn't seem something that's dark. So I think it would be great to see more reporting on successful integration. I think there's some of that at, at DW in Germany is quite good. Um, El País in Spain has done some really great reporting on that. But overwhelmingly, I think when we talk about immigration, it's always the problem of immigration as opposed to all of the benefits and all of the ways that, that our countries, not just the United States, but around the world have benefited from that. Um, so I'd like to see more, more solutions journalism around it and more thoughtful wording also. I think that, um, and I've fallen into this trap too as a reporter where you refer to somebody as a migrant or an immigrant as opposed to a person primarily. Uh, and I actually ended up writing a piece where I, I, really, I kind of consciously changed the language and um, didn't mention, you know, talked about what happened to this man but didn't talk, didn't mention the word migrant until two thirds of the way through the piece. And uh, people wrote me about it because they noticed. They noticed that that happened and, and, and I think that it humanizes people. So I think that being thoughtful about the language we use and how we describe people and how we describe the issues would also be a way of, of having more thoughtful conversations in the public forum around this that aren't quite so polarized. Thank you. Karina, yeah. let's finish the way we started it. Okay. Um, I wholeheartedly agree about solutions journalism and highlighting success stories and showing that things aren't so black and white and always one way or, or the other way. Um, I think that one way that journalists can respond and kind of contribute to, to debate and conversation on these issues is by interviewing the people concerned by the debates. Um, I think that one of the reasons why I proposed in my fellowship to interview high school and middle school students was because in France there was, especially after the 2015 attacks, a lot of conversation in the news about high schools and middle schools in the banlieue, in the suburbs of Paris primarily. Um, and I read all of these articles about what should be discussed in schools in order to promote tolerance, in order to foster a culture of republicanism, etc. And I never saw any of the teenagers, any of those middle school, high school students be interviewed. Um, and so I really focused on trying to do that as part of my reporting. And teenagers actually have a lot to say. Um, so I think that journalism can benefit from talking to the people concerned first by the, the question at hand. Thank you. Thank you very much for this. Um, so we could take now maybe a few questions. I don't know if Sarah is here or if we I'm have any time have. constraint. But OK. We, we, we do have time constraints. So uh, I want time. How like much more do we have? Five minutes. Five minutes, okay. So really nice pointed question, you know, <laughs> only if your life depends on it. <laughs> Julie? Um, Karina, I was just wanting to ask you, when we lived in France in 2013-14, we were seeing this unusual rise of right-wing activism, which was really new. On gay marriage, there definitely there definitely was a large-scale mobilization in the streets. I haven't seen that. In, I mean, in France, where protests are so common, there was very little far-right activism. Recently, Génération Identitaire, that identitarian group that I mentioned a little bit ago, did stage a protest in Paris, and I think that they drew like 300 people. Um, that's it. Um, as opposed to other marches recently against Islamophobia, clearly today against pension reforms and all kinds of economic reforms, draw hundreds of thousands of people, and this was kind of a, a paltry little march. So if you were concerned about the rise of far-right activism, I don't think that it is that robust. How is in particular? Like that is the well, yeah, so with gay marriage and like <coughs> mariage pour tous, yeah. all of that I think is, is maybe a little bit different. I didn't yeah. see that. I feel like since 2013, 2014, that hasn't been so much of an issue. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I have a longer way. If somebody else has another, I'm happy to wrap up with a question. Go So, on the matter of the official approach to Islam, uh, the subject of attitude change and behavioral change has been intensively studied for a century, starting with French uh, sociologists. The general conclusion after a century is that uh, vilification and deprecation and coercion are bad ways 
evil behavioral change and attitude change. In your interviews, did you detect any current, any discussion about people who say, this approach is really not going to work for France, there's another way, or, or there's nobody talking about that? People are definitely talking about that. I think especially, are you saying to people who kind of question or challenge the assimilationist approach? No, I'm, oh. th there's another way to deal with people besides coercive ways. Right. You can be open, you can be welcoming, you can say, okay, we don't agree about things, but we'll take you into our home, we'll try to get, you know, find a way to live together. Is that part of the discussion, or that's not part of the discussion? I think it is a little bit part of the discussion, um, but I think that kind of the, the strict adherence to this idea that in order to participate in French life, there are certain criteria that need to be met in the public sphere, so in terms of religious expression, for example, kind of limits how far the argument of we can live together and coexist, how, how far that kind of vision can, can be developed, I think. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, it's, uh, Gregory, you well, want just, to just a quick, uh, I was afraid that my question is sort of too general, but I want to ask between, Jean Benoit, between your fellowship and currently yours, you know, we live in a world where uh, it's changing quite quickly. So, I mean, France is an, is an amazing country. In what other country do so many people come out on the street like, like they are uh, today to, to, to you know, protect, protect their way of life, whatever you think about uh, uh, the, the motives? Um, and a lot, of, you know, these debates about the about the about the veil, about uh, 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 migrants, immigrants, uh, they're cyclical. There were riots in 2005. That you know, these things happen, and they happen in other countries. How much of this, the current debate, is what the, the, the same kind of debate that, uh, that, that that you witnessed when you were you were in France? And what has fundamentally changed in a country where now both the the right and the left. Uh, political parties are emasculated, where you have a president who represents a completely new political force. Is, is the contradiction between, for example, how you put it so well, this compromise in reality and sort of absolute symbolism, is, has this come to a head? Or is it the France that you recognize from your time there? No, I think it's very, very much the France that it, 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 is, it is evolving in, 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 in short hops and and sometimes there's a leap, you know, I, I, I for example, uh, politics used to be about right and left, and now they, the, the right and left is still there, but there's a new component, it's the internationalist, European, pro-European versus the sovereignist nationalists. It's a component that was not, that was not really there, but is more affirmed now in, in uh, in French politics, a completely reversal to, uh, for example, in Quebec, where it was not federalist against separatist, and now it's right and left. You know, it has, it has reversed in Quebec, and in France, it, at about the same time, it has reversed the other way. Um, I do not know... Uh, uh, the, the one thing that didn't change is the, the will of assimilation. They really... Everybody in France wants to be assimilated. It's a very positive concept in France. The assimilation is, is, is being part of the whole, and, and it's amongst the reasons why they're not keeping statistics and all that on, on, on ethnicity and religion, but it's a very strong will, and even the people who suffer from the system, the present system, and the neglect, I'll say, when you, uh, you speak to them, and my experience has been, they really want to be assimilated, that's what they want, and that has not changed. I don't see a change. <laughs> um, Americanism, anti-Americanism has changed a lot. Yes, it's, um, it's less, ex it's expressed okay, a lot it's, less. Okay, interest in English has changed a lot. These are the yeah, big things that yeah, stuck yeah, to me. Yeah. Much more openness about things that they used to be told to not to pay, like completely talked about. So, yeah. And that, that's, that's this. And it's sort of, what we saw was a sort of, um, the French are a bit down on themselves and looking for solutions elsewhere. That's how we sort of saw it. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Big, yeah. Thank you very much for that. And that's, uh, that's good to finish on a positive note. Um, it's been an incredible privilege to, uh, to be able to discuss these difficult topics with the three of you, Jean-Benoît Nadeau, mm -hmm. Maria Politzer, and Karina Heiser. Thank you very much.
I'm not thanking the microphone. <laughs> uh, I want to, to thank as well the, uh, the audience for your, your attention. There is food in the library. Uh, it's quite good. It comes from uh, Petit Plat, an excellent restaurant. So please enjoy that and uh, feel free to discuss with the, uh, the, the panelists yes. uh, and Karina in particular as you're enjoying Petit Plat. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you.